double-digit Ks. We're busting ours. It's yours. Fun to watch. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfect. Oh, mercy! Five, four, two, two, one. Welcome into Mass and All Access. I'm your host, Paul Mancano. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that from wherever you're joining us, you're safe, you're healthy, and you're with your family. In just a bit, I'm going to have Orioles pitching prospect Michael Bauman on the show. But first, it's been almost exactly two months since spring training was abruptly halted. But the first step in an eventual return has been taken. Yesterday, owners reportedly approved a proposal for the 2020 season. Now, there are still numerous hurdles to be cleared. And it's far from a guarantee that the players' union will accept this proposal, but here are the terms nonetheless. According to Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, some of the tenets of the proposal include a regular season consisting of about 80 games. Teams would face opponents from the same division and same geographic division in the opposite league. For example, AL East teams would play other AL East teams and NL East teams. Teams would play in as many home ballparks as possible, and the playoff format would be expanded to include seven teams from each league instead of five. And with the potential of no fans in the stands, players would likely be asked to accept a reduction in pay. Well, we're continuing our 20 in 20 series, highlighting 20 Orioles players to keep your eye on in 2020 and beyond. Two exciting double-A pitchers to talk about today, Michael Bauman and Zach Lowther. Let's start with Lowther. Zach Lowther's 2019 season was his first with double-A buoy, and it couldn't have gotten off to a better start. It's the sixth strikeout of the night for Zach Lowther. The lefty had a 1.66 ERA through the first two months of the season. I'm not an overpowering pitcher. Being able to use my stuff to the best of its ability is something that is going to help me get to each next level. By the end of the year, Lowther led the Eastern League in strikeouts and was second in ERA. You know, I have the deception part to my delivery, so as long as I can stay out of them part of the plate, then I'm going to have more success than not. Lowther and Alex Wells formed a killer one-two punch at the top of the Bay Sox rotation. We're on the train. We're rolling right now. This pair of southpaws could top Norfolk staff in 2020. Lowther won the Orioles' co-minor league pitcher of the year award in 2018, and honestly, he had a solid case to go back-to-back. He made 26 starts a 255 ERA in AA Bowie, 154 strikeouts. That comes out to about 9.4 Ks per nine. Even though his fastball tops out around 92 miles per hour, his low release point and high spin rate keep hitters off balance as they hit just 197 against him in 2019. Next up is a tall drink of water, six foot four righty, Michael Bauman. Michael Bauman got his first taste of double A ball in June 2019. Now he's on top of the hill, peering in, he's one strike away. And he didn't take long to acquaint himself. A cold strike three, he has done it on a high fastball. Bauman tossed a no hitter in his fifth appearance with Bowie. He finished the season with a 2.31 ERA in Eastern League play. It's another complete game shutout for Mike Bauman. Bauman shared the Orioles Minor League Pitcher of the Year award with Grayson Rodriguez. Sticking to my strengths and working on my weaknesses on a daily basis. The big man from Minnesota is making a case to head up to Baltimore within the next couple of years. Here Bauman's cumulative stats in 2019. He made 11 starts in Frederick, then 11 in Bowie, with two appearances out of the pen. He actually had an ERA more than a run and a half lower in Bowie than he did in Frederick. 149 total strikeouts. That's over 10 Ks per nine. He also had three times as many strikeouts as he did walks. He'll turn 25 in September, so he'll be awfully close to Baltimore when baseball resumes. If you're looking for a deeper dive into what Bauman brings to the table, why not ask Austin Hayes, who is Bauman's teammate back at Jacksonville University? He's just a silent killer. 
the <laughs> nicest guy ever, always doing the right thing, outworks everybody, first one at the field, last one to leave. I mean, you look at the guy, he, he looks like he should be playing defensive end for the Ravens. <laughs> yeah. He puts his kind of baseball uniform, he's out there on the mound, and he, he's just intimidating, but little do you know, he's the nicest guy ever. Scouting report, he's got the heaviest fastball ever. You don't want to play catch with him, it's going to hurt your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need it, if you need him to break in a glove for you, just go play catch with him for five minutes. He'll be broken in pretty quick. He's got a heavy, heavy basketball. Every time I see him, he looks like he's grown another three inches and put on another 30 pounds of muscle. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I think it's just because his hair is getting longer, so he's getting some more flow. He yeah, yeah. adds a little bit to it. I think my favorite thing about Mike is that he shows no emotion on the mound. <laughs> like, if he's given up seven runs in two innings or He's gone out and he's throwing a no hitter in the top of the ninth. You can't. It's, he's just stone cold. That's why I said he's a silent killer because you just don't know if he's doing good or bad. He's he's just focused on the next pitch and he just doesn't let anything get to him. I love that about him. Now we bring on Michael Bauman, who joins us via Zoom down from Jacksonville, Florida. Michael, thank you so much for hopping on Mass and All Access. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. So how are you spending this time? You're a Minnesotan. Jacksonville is a quite different environment, but it's an environment that you're used to considering you played college ball down there. How are you enjoying the weather, staying in shape? Yeah, the weather's been great. It definitely helps, helps me be able to get outside more so than I would be able to back home in Minnesota. <laughs> but, um, you know, the leadership up top has been great about, um, you know, giving us resources, um, you know, virtually to – you know, kind of give us a plan on how we can work out, stay in shape, give us ideas like that. So, you know, I've been able to go to a local park and um, train with some some other local baseball players. So, you know, I'm pretty lucky down here. I can't complain. And you had a great 2019 season, as we all know. You started the season in Frederick. You ended up uh, in Bowie. And in your fifth appearance in Bowie, you threw a no-hitter. And you actually had an ERA a run and a half lower in Bowie than you did in Frederick. What helped change and what helped the transition between high A ball and double A? Um, I think just sticking it, sticking to the developmental plan they've, they've given us, you know, the pitching coaches at each level were, were all on the same page and they knew, you know, what, what kind of tools I needed each day to work on my craft. And, you know, I think, um, you know, just kind of sticking to that and working on what I needed to do to get better each day kind of kind of, kind of helped me in the long run. So, you know, I think things just started to click throughout the season. Well, Mike, they call you Big Mike. You call yourself Big Mike on Instagram. You're a big guy. You're 6'4". Does your size give you some kind of advantage on the mound? Because, look, I, I've never been the biggest in my class, in any grade, I've never been a big dude. So I'm legitimately asking you, does your size help you on the mound, uh, whether it's an intimidation factor, whether it's it's just the fact that you bring a, a larger presence, I guess, uh, when you're up up there on the mound? Uh, you know, I'm not too sure. I can't, I can't <laughs> speak for the hitters on that. But, um, you know, <laughs> I like to think, you know, it gives me somewhat of an advantage i don't know i gotta thank my parents for that one <laughs> yeah no I, I trust me i've given my parents grief about not being that size so that's fair uh you have the you, you have the fastball which is one of your best pitches uh it sits in the 94 95 mile per hour range but it can get up to 98 99 A question for you is have you hit 100 miles per hour on the speed gun yet whether it be in a game or just throwing out uh in a bullpen Uh, no, not yet. That's that's the goal. That's one of the goals in the long run. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but uh, ho hopefully one of these days. We'll see. And the additional pitches, you have a slider, which is uh, scouts rate that up with your fastball as your best off-speed pitch. What is it about the slider that makes it so effective? Um, you know, I think maybe it's, it's a little firmer maybe than most. Um, you know, I, I like to think it's a little tighter, but, um, you know, it's, it's something I can rely on and throw in the zone. So um, it, it's just something I can throw off my fastball and keep hitters off balance with. 
when you say firmer or tighter, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, being able to throw it a little bit harder, um, it's, it's a little cuttery, so, um, you know, I, I don't know if that has something to do with it, but, um, you know, it, it's something I can throw off my fastball. And you also have the addition of a curveball and a changeup to go along with that fastball slider. Between those two pitches, which would you say you rely on the most and you feel the most comfortable with? I'd say my changeup. They're both developing pitches, but if I had to pick one that I'm more comfortable with, I'd say changeup. But, um, you know, they're both a work in progress and something I can continue to work on. Did you have all four of those pitches when you were pitching down at Jacksonville in college, or were those pitches that you developed along the way during your pro career? I uh, just kind of developed them throughout my pro career. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't throw much. I was kind of relied heavily on my fastball going into Jacksonville, and you know, I started to develop my slider kind of later on while I was there. So uh, the curveball and changeup, you know, were, were always something that I struggled with. So um, you, you know, it's all they're always. Uh, always something I can improve. And you mentioned trying to add some ticks to that fastball, getting up to 100 miles an hour. How do you do that? Is it a mechanical thing? Is it just a repetition thing? How do you develop uh, miles per hour on a fastball that already is getting close to 100? Um, I, I think um, maybe just the delivery thing, working on you know sequencing things up. But um, if, you have, if you have the answer, if you ever find out, let me know. <laughs> Uh, I will let you know if I have that answer, but uh, probably not going to be, probably going to be you before me. Um, so in terms of the 2020 season, did you have an idea of where you might start out the season because you had such great success at the end of the year in Bowie, but you didn't get a full season in A under your belt? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if they sent me back if I was sent there, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to assume anything and you know, I'm, I was willing to go wherever, and, you know, the biggest thing is just continuing to work on what I need to work on and improve. So, um, you know, I was looking forward to the season coming up. What specific goals did you have for yourself in 2020, whether it be developing certain pitches or sequences or just becoming an all-around better pitcher? I uh, just, you know, I think um, my biggest goal is just kind of working on consistency and becoming an all-around better pitcher and, um you know, taking it day by day there and, you know, um, you know, just trying to get the most out of my ability. And you got a taste of double A as mentioned and a taste of a great ball club with the Bowie Bay Sox. What kind of culture do you think Buck Britton had built with that team, a team that really had came on strong in the second half and event, eventually made it to the Eastern League uh, championship? Yeah, it was awesome coming up to that club. Um, you know, I came kind of when they started that. They had already started that nice little winning streak. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of good energy going on, um, a lot of excitement in the clubhouse that, you know, Buck and the rest of the coaching staff had a, you know, great part in. Um, so, you know, the, the team was very welcoming and, you know, showing up, they made showing up to the field each day enjoyable and exciting. So, I um, mean, you know, I was able to come up there and, you know, the rest of the pitching staff and the guys in the field playing behind us, you know, we're putting on a show each night. So, you know, being in Bowie was an exciting time last year. And then to end the season, you get a trip up to Oriole Park at Camden Yards as one of the Orioles co-minor league pitchers of the year. And you get to hang out with one of your former teammates at Jacksonville and your good buddy, Austin Hayes. What was that like getting to see Austin Hayes get another taste of big league ball in September and really putting on a show? Man, it was special. You know, being able to see him in uniform up there was great. And, you know, I, I've seen the work he's put in and, you know, the time and effort. And, you know, I'm happy for him. And, you know, he he's he's definitely he's definitely um, been a big role model for me, too. You know, he's he's someone you can look up to on and off the field. And he's one of the better teammates I've ever played with. So, you know, it's it's it pretty special. And Orioles fans were pretty dazzled, I guess you could say, with his shows in the outfield, his ability to make incredible catches, his ability to dive and lay out for catches. Was that something that you saw back when you were teammates together in Jacksonville? 
Yeah, that, that's nothing new to me. That's uh, that's just another day at the ballpark for him. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to play with him for two years and see what he can do. And, you know, he's a special player out there. So he, he's fun to watch. Awesome. Well, you are as well. And hopefully we get to see you down in Bowie again or Norfolk or wherever it may be within the coming months. And hopefully we get a return to baseball. So, Michael, thank you so much for hopping on here on Mass and All Access. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. Well, the 2020 regular season won't be the only part of the game that will be affected by this shutdown. The MLB draft will reportedly be just five rounds, meaning Mike Elias and the Orioles front office will be working with just six draft picks instead of the usual 40-some. Elias will be leaning heavily on the scouting he and his team did before baseball's shutdown. Back in February, I sat down with the Orioles GM to discuss his long history in scouting. Sitting down here with Orioles GM Mike Elias here from Sarasota, Florida, spring training. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. You bet, Paul. Great to be here, as always, kick off the year. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about scouting because you started as a scout. How did you get into scouting? I was playing baseball. I was a starting pitcher, so when you're not pitching, you watch a lot of baseball, and I always enjoyed watching the other players, sizing them up, getting an eye on who was going to be drafted and where they'd go in the draft. So I was always interested in the draft and scouting. I realized I wasn't going to be able to play professionally. I wasn't good enough and um, you know my college coach at the time, a guy named John Stuper, was a former major league pitcher and he had some connections and um, ultimately got me in touch with uh, Dan Kantrovitz who at the time was with the St. Louis Cardinals and they hired me to be a young scout at the age of 23. So um, cut my teeth, uh, kind of learning on the job. A lot of talk in scouting is about the five tools that a player can have. The common baseball idea, however, over the past couple of years is it's less important to have all five tools and more important maybe to have one or two great tools. Is that kind of your thinking as well? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you start getting into what we call uh, player profiles and a guy can just have one or two tools and if they're strong enough, they can carry him to being a great major league player. Like for instance, somebody with no defensive value, uh, but who hits 320 with 30 home runs like Edgar Martinez. Um, you know, it's a, it's a Hall of Fame caliber career, but you talk about that profile now, he's, he's gonna be a DH or a, a first baseman. So uh, the tools really work into what and where you're gonna be able to play on the baseball diamond, not that it's necessary to have all five of them. How hard is it to determine the difference between a guy who has a great tool and somebody who is just capable in a certain area. It's tough and that's what the scouting business is. There are some tools where we are aided by technology, uh, even very simple technology like a stopwatch or a radar gun. We can know specifically if somebody is what we would call an 80 runner, an 80 being the top grade you can get on the, on the scouting scale. Um, same with the fastball. When it comes to a hit tool or a glove tool, that requires the, the, the scouts' impressions and opinions to get it right, and, and it's, it's no science. So that's where the fun comes in. Moving from the young players to some of the older players, a lot of times when a team is looking to make trades at the deadline, they'll send scouts to see a veteran player in a major league ballpark, even though you might have plenty of tape on that guy that is available to everybody. Is there something to sending a scout to see somebody in person, even though you might have seen him on videotape? Yeah, sure. I mean, we have every bit of video imaginable, that, that um, especially at the major league level. Um, we also have uh, tech um, that, that fans can get on the internet now with, with StatCast data. So we've got all that, but there is still value to be added uh, by sending a, an experienced evaluator to the park to watch the player. A lot of that is because uh, the, the television broadcasts don't catch everything, especially on defense. Um, there's quite a bit happening pre-pitch, between pitches, and even after the ball is struck that's not caught on the, uh, the broadcast camera. Uh, but also a scout in a ballpark tends to get a lot of information. I mean, he talks to people around the team um, and gets a sense of what's going on with the player. So uh, there's certainly value to be added there, even in today's game. How does one scout hire another scout. Do you look for people who have the same evaluation tools? Do you look for different perspectives? What do you look for when hiring another scout under you? Sure, well, the, the first thing is the scout typically has had to have gotten um, his foot in the door in the baseball world, whether that is 
you know, maybe he's just coming off the field having played a few years of minor league ball, or he's worked for a perfect game or a private scouting service, or he's had an internship or two with another major league team. All that helps because you got to be around the amateur player market. You've got to kind of learn the language that scouts speak a little bit. Otherwise, the learning curve is going to be a little too steep for that first full-time job. So once we see somebody who's got the resume, we then want to make sure that they've got the mindset we're looking for, and that's um, wanting to learn, you know, having a good baseball eye, but being humble, being curious, all of those things. It's it's uh, much like you would uh, interview for any job. When you have a player that you personally scout or that you have seen in person, you go to bat for that player. You say this player is the guy we want to draft. We want to evaluate and then he goes on to have success. How much pride do you take personally in seeing success stories come from guys that you scouted? It's extraordinarily rewarding because it's so hard. Um, you know, you look at the draft and it's, it's filled with failure. Um, so when we do get a guy right or even halfway right, it, it, it feels really good and it's, um, you know, rewarding for all the work that you put in and a reminder that, you know, you know what you're doing. Um, and over time, you're, um, you just hope that your body of work is a little bit better than, than average or better than the next guys, uh, even though this is a tough business. And because that batting average sometimes is below 500 just because of the difficulty of the business, do you ever look back on the misses, try to evaluate the things you might have missed or the things that you might have evaluate differently if you were to do it again? Oh yeah, they absolutely haunt you. Um, I mean, you, you think of uh, bad first round picks that you were part of, you think of bad second round picks, bad seventh round picks, and you never stop thinking about it. Um, at least I think the good scouts are that way because it helps them make them a little bit better process wise the next time when they think about what they what they could have done differently. Uh, but yeah, it is it is not fun and it never leaves you. The role of a GM is of a much bigger scope, obviously, than a particular scout. How much scouting do you still get to do? How much tape do you still get to watch, particularly of young guys who are about to be drafted? Well, uh, when we're preparing for the draft, we watch video and review reports and read statistics on all of the players um, prior to the draft. So I, I, I'm intimately involved in that process. Um, in terms of in-person scouting, I still do a, a good bit of it. Um, I, part of that is because we train here in Florida and Florida is like the best hotbed in February and March. I'm able to get out and see some games that I might not otherwise get to. But right now, uh, with where we're at as an organization, we're picking high in the draft. And certainly for those picks, um, for the number two overall pick in 2020, I'm gonna personally scout every one of them. The life of a scout can obviously be very difficult as well. You spend a lot of time away from your family on the road. Do you miss certain aspects of in-person scouting or are you okay with not getting to do that kind of stuff? Yeah, the, uh, the, the chase of it and the, the sprint uh, that takes place from about February 1st to, to the draft in June is something that, that I miss being a part of every single day. Um, it's rough uh, on your, your sleep and your uh, family time um, for sure. Uh, but uh, it, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you, you, you make a lot of friends and meet a lot of good people out on the road, but it, it's, uh, it's difficult. You're having to not only evaluate the players, but check the weather, uh, check flights and hotel rates constantly, um, and it's, there's nothing like it. What's the biggest misconception you think that the general public and baseball fans have about the business of scouting? Well, I think it's that. Um, you know, I think some fans, they, when they see a scout at the games, they think, oh, this guy just watches baseball games for a living. Um, but that is, the, the, the part where you're sitting in the park watching the game or standing in the park watching the game is about 10% of your real work and, and uh, 40 to 50% of it is just travel or working on travel or getting from point A to point B. It's a lot of driving, um, a lot of really difficult uh, types of travel. You're getting to really obscure parts of the United States where they don't have nice hotels and they don't have airports nearby. And um, there's so much that goes into that. And then you have to write reports, and then you have to get on the phone with agents, and then you have to talk to your connections. So there's so much that goes into it. There's really not enough hours in the day when we're talking about the baseball season. And of course, you probably don't have many hours in your day here in Sarasota, being the GM of 67 players in that clubhouse as well. So thanks for taking the time to sit down here on Mass and All Access. You bet, Paul. Thanks. Mike Elias, GM of the Baltimore Orioles. 
That just about does it for Mass and All Access today. If you're looking for more on Bauman and Lowther tomorrow, we've got a Mass and All Access podcast hitting the airwaves, catching up with Adam Pohl, who is the Bowie Bay Sox broadcaster. He gives some insight into those two young pitchers. Don't forget, we also have shows coming out every Tuesday at 3 o'clock, so be sure to stay tuned for next week's show as well. Thanks to Hannah Broder and Bobby Blanco behind the scenes. As always, remember, stay home, stay healthy, stay safe. It's only one way we're getting through this, and that is together. We'll see you later.